I'm Seth. I'm a consultant at Data. And today uh, we're going to be talking about how to build and tell a more powerful story of differentiation and value for your business. So I'm sure you've all heard this, right? People remember stories. Like I've never seen a good, strong, compelling sales pitch that was a PowerPoint of features and benefits, but you still see it all the time. Okay. People remember stories. There's a beginning, a middle and end. There's a hero, there's a villain. So when you think about how you talk about your services, how you talk about your products, how you pitch, it's always best to think about it as a story. So, I mean, some businesses choose to use strong, impactful stories and others choose like weak, insignificant stories. So we, we work with um, hundreds of companies and we've chose this topic for two reasons. One, the story creates a base for all things sales and marketing. So think like design and sales pitches, and websites and general copy, like it all builds on that core story. So it's really high stakes. And two, uh, businesses in all industries tend to struggle with it. Another thing to know about stories is that they're, they're often used in fragments. Okay, so they need to have versatility. You can pull little bits from your story or consolidate your story to fit different applications. And, and fragments of your sh story show up in, in all kinds of big spots, like the website and sales material and, and even just your everyday language. So speaking of strong stories and, and weak stories, I wanted to start off with a real world example. Uh, here's a website for a company that makes and sells air medical equipment. So they head it off by saying medical flight equipment, and then it tells you what follows is a list, you know, and, and here's another website for a company that makes and sells air medical equipment. What's different? I mean, one, one leads with a, a series of products and the other leads with a story and illustrates of the product. And I mean, like a lot of you, both companies are trapped in this world of product specs and material quality and capabilities, but Spectrum Airmed taps into the emotional side of the buyer and it really draws you in. And think about this too, which company would you rather go work for? You know, a company that helps heroes save lives or a company that tells you it's going to give you a list of equipment and then it gives you a list of equipment. And in no way are either of these uh, complete stories, right? What we're looking at here are, are fragments, but, th but this is a, a great example of how, how story fragments show up in big spots. And when I see stuff like this too, it's a pretty good indicator of the story. So who, who do you think is going to deliver a stronger sales pitch? You know, I mean, which, which trade show booth do you think gets more attention? It's pretty clear. So uh, oftentimes we hear, be good at storytelling, but there's no instructions beyond that. So what actually goes into making a great story? Here's a high level overview that gives us kind of what I'd call the anatomy of a compelling pitch using the story framework. And we're going to get into each of these in more detail. So this kind of acts as our, our agenda for what we're going to run through today. But zoomed out, here's the process we need to work through. First, we need to know what belongs in the story. Uh, it's easier to figure out what, the, what these points are first so that you know what you're working with before you start stitching the story together. And then next, you need to fit all of the pieces of your story into a structure. And in, in one thing I'll echo a number of times throughout this presentation is that order really matters, okay? Uh, when you put it all together in the right order, this is a storytelling system that works really, really well. So uh, the first thing we need to figure out is, is what goes into the story. So like I'd say, like, well, what are the jabs and haymakers that we really need to land as part of your story? Like, what's going to help, what's going to help make you win? Uh, so here, here's where we start. When, when considering kind of, you know, what punches you want to include in your story, it's really important to start by thinking about who's buying from you. So like, cause what you care about is pretty irrelevant. Like you need to start with your customer and what they care about. And we're not going to get into a whole, you know, audience identification exercise here. I'm just calling this out because it needs to be top of mind when thinking about what those key points of value are that you need to convey. So uh, think about your five to 10 very best customers. What do they really want? And what motivators do they have in common? So I understand too that it might vary a lot from buyer to buyer. I mean, like your top five customers might include uh, different roles, right? It might be, you might have an engineer, a procurement manager, and a business owner. Okay, and their motiv motivators are, are, are likely different just based on their roles. Uh, but what we want to do is go, you know, if we take all of it into consideration, what motivators do they all have in common? And that's what we want to lean into uh, when, when we're looking at uh, this next section here, our competitive advantages. So the next step is going to be to, to take, to kind of evaluate the, the competitive landscape of the market that you're in. You know, what, what do you see as your greatest competitive advantages today? Why do your customers buy from you over your competitors? 
And he's like, maybe, maybe you have some technology that nobody else has, or maybe it's a, a, a turnaround time, or maybe you offer a bunch of services under one roof in a way that nobody else can, or, or maybe you've just been in business for 60 years. It's always best if you can choose things that are quantifiable, you know, like look at our response times or, you know, look, look at the reviews, praising our CS team. And maybe it's, or maybe it's like a promoter score, but if you could put some data behind your claim, you can really give it some teeth. So it, it helps to start with a list of those competitive advantages without being too picky. You know, if you can come up with a list of, of five to competitive advantages that you see that you have in your industry, then we can look at how they stack up against each other. We always like to look at two variables when we're drawing these comparisons and, and mapping out what our story should hold inside of it. We want to look at the value to your ideal customer, and we want to look at market differentiation. Okay, we like to use a plot like this to, to really force prioritization of those core competitive advantages. And, and I mean, this is actually a great exercise that you can, you can DIY. Right now, you know, sometime today, sketch up this plot, right? Look at the, the, the value to your ideal customer and look at market differentiation. Like as, as an example, great customer service, oops, great customer service is, is always going to be, it comes up a lot, right? But it's also one that a lot of other businesses can claim. It's not like that makes it bad or anything. It just means it's really high on this axis over here, but it's close to the center or maybe even closer to, to the left on the, uh, the differentiation axis. So on the other hand, you have something like sharks with freaking laser beams, right? That might not have a ton of value to most people, but you got to admit, if you can offer that, it's pretty different. Okay, so this one goes low on the value of the customer axis, but pretty far out to the right on differentiation axis. So what you're ideally looking for when you map all these points out is what's landing in that top right corner. So like for us, it's data offers a proprietary marketing software that, that nobody else in the market has. Okay. It offers a, a level of visibility and attribution and organization that no one else can bring to market. This is one of our top right quadrant differentiators when we're mapping out what our competitive advantages are. So plot these out yourself and see if you can land on two or three that fit way up here, you know, those are the points that we really need to drive home when we're telling your story. Here's one, Cleanway Systems. This is a company, I'm going to call this one out a few times during this presentation, but this is a company that makes medical waste sterilization systems. A, a lot of hospital waste needs to get sterilized before it can be taken to a landfill. So if you think about it, like the normal stuff, you know, needles and disposable surgical equipment and amputated body parts, right? It first needs to be processed. So what we came up for them, simple, safe, sustainable. No other product on the market even comes close to Cleanway Systems on these three value points. And here's a case too where, you know, we came up with a list of probably 20 competitive advantages uh, and we were able to consolidate most of them into these three buckets, simple, safe, sustainable. It, it, it actually became their tech, okay? They, they plaster it everywhere and they've all internalized what it means so they can all speak to it with confidence. And here's kind of a, a curveball for you. There, there's more to a story than just sales, all right? So for Metco, we focused on their employer brand and their competitive advantages as an employer. And we landed on two primary things. One, it's a great, stable career, not just a short-term job, which actually does set them apart in their small little town that, that they're out of. And two, everyone has a comfortable place to belong. Okay? We augmented the story to be your career built to last, and we illustrated it with a young woman with blue hair who happens to be a pretty damn good welder. So it really makes them look different. It sets them apart. So Everything to this point has been all about what needs to go into the story. So it's kind of like all of your raw ingredients list. For the rest of the presentation, we'll be talking about how to put these pieces together into a narrative that lands. So how do you actually bake the recipe? Here's where your story starts. It's not with solutions, or competitive advantages, or features or benefits. Your story always has to start with a problem. Okay, every good story starts with a great villain, Darth Vader. You know, Sauron, Skynet, Mayor Humdinger from Paw Patrol, right? Every story needs a big bad, meaning you have to clearly articulate the big problem your potential customers face. And it doesn't even matter what you're selling. If your customer is buying from you, it's because you're solving a problem for them. So we need to get full buy-in that this problem is a huge deal. Otherwise, nobody has any motivation to make any change. So first, we introduce the bad guy, okay? 
the, the, the problem bringing your customers to the table in the first place. So then we talk about all the bad solutions to the problem. Okay, we can't just give the ring to Gandalf. We can't just hide the ring. We can't just melt it. And then we need to talk about the consequences of doing nothing or, or, or the consequences of failing to fix the problem, right? What's the worst case scenario we're up against? And, and let, let's, so let's step back a second and make a slightly more mundane comparison. So let's say you're selling outsourced IT services, right? What's the big bad in that scenario? It's hackers, it's downtime, it's business disruption, it's loss of data. Like those are, are real business risks. And, and so then what we do is we, we go out and go, well, what, what can you do about it? Okay. Well, you could try to DIY your IT by Googling a bunch of stuff and trying to figure out as best you can, but you're not the expert and there's no chance you have the time it takes to do it right. So, all right, what else could you do? Well, you could hire a single IT person to manage all your IT, but if they're a bad hire or if they leave, you're still at risk. Right? One bad IT person can do a lot of damage that, that you wouldn't even know about. And if you don't do anything for IT or for cybersecurity, or if you don't do it correctly, uh, hackers could infiltrate your business data, they could lock it down, and they could ransom it back to you for exorbitant costs. Or they could, or they could go ahead and leak your customer's credit card information. Or they could, and no matter what, it's, it could cost your business a lot of trust, right? And it could actually cost your business entirely, you know? Now, none of us, I don't know if anyone out there is selling outsourced IT services, but I think we can all agree that telling the story this way is a lot more compelling than saying we offer 99% uptime and 24 hour response time. And, and probably my favorite, we have a combined 100 years of experience and it's like, sure, these are points that are important to make it at some time. And we'll show where that stuff fits, but it's not a compelling way to lead off a story. It doesn't draw people in. And it's not going to give anybody any kind of motivation to take action. So let's take a, a look at a real world example. Let's go back to our friends at Cleanway Systems. So we open the story by talking about this big problem that is medical waste, but we take it one step further. So after we lay out this $6 billion problem of medical waste, we get into what businesses are doing right now to address it, what hospitals are doing right now to address it. So it, it goes something like this, right? For the last 70 years, hospitals have had two choices. When it comes to getting rid of infectious medical waste, they can send it to an offsite processor or they can install their own onsite system. If you choose to outsource it, you have to go through a series of steps. Okay. First, you have to sort it into different bags and bins, and then you need to put it in climate controlled storage. You need to coordinate pickup times and you have the waste where it needs to be when it needs to be there. And then you have to pay for it. Okay. There, there's no transparency to what you're actually paying for. And, and these evergreen contracts keep escalating. So, these evergreen contracts keep going up and up and up and up and up, and they're intentionally unclear, right? And at the end of the day, you just have to hope that the waste is getting processed appropriately because the hospital is responsible for the waste cradle to grave. So if there's waste spilling out of the back of a truck somewhere, or if label labels aren't properly destroyed, that's the hospital's name on the front page of the paper, right? That's the hospital going on and hiring a team of lawyers to fight a lawsuit. So for all those reasons, the VA, the EPA recommend processing waste on site, right? Okay, cool. What does that look like? Well, again, you have two options for that too. One, you can run the waste through an autoclave, which is essentially a giant pressurized rice cooker. Okay, you're using tons of water, tons of energy. It's expensive and it's dangerous to operate. And, and I'm not sure about any of you, but most would prefer not to work in an environment of steamy garbage. Okay, I don't want to be that guy, right? I don't want to be that guy. So, okay, you're not going to use an autoclave. Great. Let's fire up the incinerator. Well, this one's dangerous, right? And you don't have to be an expert in medical waste to know that burning garbage isn't exactly the most environmentally sustainable practice, okay? There's never, ever been a safe, environmentally sustainable solution for infectious waste processing. So you can see how this sets up the, the whole story, right? We start out with something that's compelling, that's meaningful. That, that people care about, right? We're not talking about all of the benefits of using Clean Waste Systems OMW products, right? We're, we're laying out the landscape and the problem and, and all existing solutions lead to despair and somebody ending up in a gutter somewhere and there's no good outcome, okay? So we need to paint that picture first. So, so that's how you set up the problem. 
But once you have the problem firmly established and the consequences are laid out, it's time to introduce some hope to our recipe. All right. So I can't throw this out there. Pop quiz. If anyone can use the chat, so everyone pull up your chat. Who's the hero? Hey, sorry, Seth. You can also raise your hand and we can enable you to speak. But yeah, the chat should be working so we can announce any answers. But anyway, sorry. Continue. Yeah. So we got the problem laid out. Now we want to bring in the hero. So who is the hero? I want someone to throw in the chat. Who is the hero of your story? I'll raise your hand. Mm. Uh-oh, we got a couple. Our solution is the hero. The problem solver is the hero. Great guesses, but you're all wrong. No, <laughs> those are good guesses, but the hero of the story is not you. The hero of the story is not the solution, okay? Your potential customer is the hero of the story. Your potential customer is the main character. You're the guy that gives the customer the tools and the knowledge they need to be the hero, right? You are Yoda. Your customer is Luke Skywalker, okay? You're Gandalf, your customer is Frodo. So what you need to do is present how your way solves the problem leaning heavily into those four competitive differentiators. You need to keep that part really concise, okay? The more important picture to paint is how your customer becomes the hero by choosing your way, okay? You need to paint a picture of what life looks like of what life looks like for your customer after they make the right decision, okay? And it's okay to be bold here too. So a couple of years ago, I, I had to buy a suit and I went to, I think it was Men's Warehouse or maybe it was Halberstadt's in Fargo. And I talked to a sales guy there and he's, he's handing me these suits and I'm like trying on these suits and I'm looking in the mirror. And, and at one point he like stops and does this double take. He goes, you look really athletic in that suit. And, and immediately me and my like 215 pound dad bod are like, it's like, that's right. Like I get to go into my next big meeting feeling athletic. Like, I get to go to my grandma's funeral looking athletic, but he did something really important here, right? He made me the hero. It wasn't about the quality of the suit or the style of the suit or the breathability of the suit. He, he made me believe that I had a path to look athletic, I guess, but only by way of buying this way too expensive suit, all right? And it's a suit that I then had no choice but to buy. So now, great, Seth, right? That's a retail, like consumer product example. But you know, how, how does this look in, in the real world, especially if we're selling, selling B2B, right? Well, going back to our clean waste systems example, the, the first thing we do is we clearly illustrate the solution and we present the value. So how do you make the hospital CEO into the hero in the story? Well, sometimes it works better to do it with narrative or with spoken word than it does to try to illustrate it in, say, a, a slide deck. So he, he, let's try this. You, Mrs. Hospital CEO, get to walk downstairs and tell your maintenance technician that they don't have to go home smelling like a steaming pile of garbage every night. Okay? You're choosing to be a leader in sustainability, and you get to put out a press release about how you're materially reducing your carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emissions. You can go into your next board meeting and report that you found a way to reduce operating costs by $4 million over the next 10 years. It feels a little bit different when you make the hospital CEO the hero of the story than it does if you talk about how your solution has X, Y, and Z features and benefits. So that's what you're shooting for. You want to make your customer the hero. All right, so we've told you the beginning of the story and you've framed yourself as the guide that's going to give your customer everything they need to defeat the bad guy. But the next thing we need to look at is why should your prospect trust you? Okay, now, now this is when you need to appeal to that logical, that critical side of the brain. So what we need to do is back up your story with proof. Okay, so how does your solution work for others? Okay, what tangibles can you use to support your story? Here are some of the, the tools that you can or really should use to back up and improve your story. Someone want to call it specifically case studies, if they make sense in your industry. Show some examples of, of how the great work that you've done has helped your customer, your now very successful customer, solve a big problem. I really like testimonials and reviews. I mean, who else here skips the Amazon product description and heads right for the review section? Right? These days, consumers are trained to look for reviews on everything from makeup to golf clubs to $5 million pieces of equipment. 
Okay, we believe what others say about you way more than we believe about what you, than we believe what you say about you. Okay, reviews are becoming a non-negotiable part of a buyer journey, and in, in even in B two B purchases. And before you say that, hey, that's just young people, Seth. Well, I mean, Forrester put out a, a 2023 study. More than 60 percent of B two B buyers today are now millennials or Gen Z, and that number is only going to keep going up. All right, real photos, real videos. People can smell stock photos from a mile away. And the easier it gets to have something fake, like stock photos or AI generated images or deep fakes, like the more powerful the real stuff it gets. So get real photos, get real videos, and, and humanize your brand to build trust. One I really like is if you can do any kind of ROI or economic modeling, it makes this tangible benefit really real. So that's one of the things we do in Clean Way Systems is we show the payoff over time. If you use a clean waste systems product versus, you know, a competitor or an alternative solution, and you can really see how the savings stack up and makes it real, it sets expectations. You're also not necessarily making like hard promises. It's just like, hey, here's an example of how this has worked for somebody else. I, I like this one too, logos. Who else is doing business with you? I like to call it an NASCAR slide. Uh, these can exist on a website too. Uh, guarantees, promises, things like that. And I know we've picked on clean waste systems a lot. But uh, here's another client of ours, Lindar. You know, we've got real photos of real people doing real work. They've got great online reviews. You've got your little, your little NASCAR section down here on the website, with, and you've got certifications and awards. So anything you can do to really back up, back up the story and prove it is going to make an impact. We'll go with, let's go to a, an employer brand example. So I'm just going to play this for you. This is uh, Jaybird. So you go onto their careers page. This is the very first thing you see. All right, it's not you know job openings. It's not you know qualifications or requirements or anything like that. It's this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna play this as about a 15 second clip. Working for Jaybird companies is very rewarding because they reward you for working hard. You're gonna do this for a living. Have fun with it. It's just take pride in it. It's and it's fun too. It's just like for me, it's like building Legos. <laughs> what I did as a kid. Sense <laughs> like right. So. I mean, any main character out there looks at Austin and, and wants to be him, right? And like I said, this is the first thing you see. It's not job openings, benefits, requirements. It's, it's a picture of what life could be like if you worked at Jaybird. They call it the bird life. Now, here's, here's what the bird life looks like. Working for Jaybird. Okay, so bringing this in, you know, for a landing here, what does it look like? What does it look like to build a compelling story? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to figure out what belongs in the story. After that, you have to get it organized. You have to start with the problem and you have to present a better way with your customer as the hero. And finally, you have to reinforce everything you've laid out with a boatload of proof. So prove it. Can you actually do it? So this is a framework that we've seen be successful for many businesses. It's proven and it works in any industry too. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you all for questions. So. Q&A. Yeah, please feel free to throw any in the chat and we can announce them since everyone can't see the chat. Um, otherwise, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to speak or utilize the Q&A function. Awesome, thanks. We have a question in the Q&A. Question in the Q&A. From Emma B, we have two very distinct types of customers. Does that mean we have two stories? How do we present that in places like our website where we need to appeal to everyone? Okay, this is a great question. So if we go back to, we've run into this quite a bit. If we go back up to like the example of clean waste systems right here, going all the way back to the setup. So one thing to know about clean waste systems is they sell, they sell to hospitals, but they also sell to off-site waste processing centers. So obviously this story doesn't work if this is our customer. So we definitely had to adjust, augment the story to fit the two distinct customers. So we actually have two decks, there's two narratives. And, and but I mean, a lot of it can say the same. It's still simple, safe, sustainable. We probably adjusted 30% of the story to fit the different audiences. And then on the website, that's a little trickier too, because you know, we can't speak directly to hospitals necessarily on the website. I've, I've, we've done things like sales material, like our sales collateral, trade show 
booth display setup. We have one for hospitals. We have one for waste processing centers. So I think the answer is, yeah, I think you need to have it. You need to be able to adjust your story based on who you're selling to. Sometimes that's just how you say it. And sometimes that's the actual visual presentation of it as well.